Sin is a name synonymous with law and order upon Romney Marsh. The Sins of Lid have been attorneys at law for the Marsh men since the old days. So, an ancient town, Lid, and an ancient race, the Sins. Prolific, too, as their massed ranks of tombstones in the churchyard show. But in the mid-years of the 18th century, the Sins found themselves represented only by old Solomon Sin, attorney at Romney, and his nephew, Christopher Sin, the youngest Don at Queen's College, Oxford. Christopher's father had been clerk to the lords of the level of Romney Marsh under Sir Charles Cobtree. In the Jacobite uprising of 1745, he had buckled on his sword and joined the young pretender's force. He wisely left his wife and only child under the guardianship of his brother Solomon and Sir Charles Cobtree. Wisely, for with three of his brothers, he was killed at Culloden. His wife died the same year of a broken heart, it was said, and thus at the age of eighteen was Christopher Sin an orphan. In the year 1754, when this history begins, Christopher Sin was in his twenty-fifth year, a resident classical tutor at Queen's College, a doctor of divinity, a priest, but more than all, a man of high romance. On a misty September morning, young Christopher Sin was riding along the Dimchurch Sea Wall in the direction of Lim. He had spent his summer vacation happily, partly with his uncle at New Romney and partly with his friend Tony Cobtree at Dimchurch. The young student turned inland and cantered his tall grey horse along the winding roads that crossed the marsh. Above him he could see his objective, the grim walls of Lim Castle. He was on his way there to see Sir Henry Penbury. As man and horse threaded their way uphill between blocks of crumbling masonry, all that was left of the great Roman Portus Lomanus, a sharp voice cried, Who goes there? I knows you. Halt and put your hands above your head. Dr. Sin halted, not so much from fear as from astonishment. He looked at the ruined bastion he was approaching, but could see nothing unusual. Whom do you take me for? he asked politely. For what you are, of course, came the indignant answer. The new riding officer at Sangate, grey horse and all, and dressed like an undertaker. It was then that Dr. Sin noticed a blunderbuss wobbling at him through a fissure in the wall. You call me a custom man, do you? he replied sharply. Well, as a marshman born and bred, I take that as an insult. You, no doubt, are the Mr. Mipps who works in Rate's boat-building yard at Dimchurch under the wall. I know all about you from Tony Cobtree. You're a carpenter by trade and a smuggler for profit. I am no smuggler myself, but my people, the Sins of Lid, have saved many a one from the gallows. There was a whistle of astonishment, and the blunderbuss was withdrawn. Ah, well then, there's no quarrel, and I ask your honour's pardon. You'll be old Mr. Solomon's nephew, no doubt. Quite right, Dr. Sin. A sawbones? No, a parson. Come out of that fortification and shake hands. Not me, replied the voice. No showing myself on no skylines in case ruddy customs does appear. But step in, I'll give you as good a drink as you've ever tasted. So Dr. Sin tied up his horse and entered the ruined bastion. Mr. Mipps proved to be very thin, very small, dressed like a sailor, and carrying an atmosphere of important impertinence. He welcomed his guest with a hard grip and then removed the bung from a hand anchor of brandy. Dr. Sin drank with relish. Mipps, in his turn, drank deep. I drink to the sins a lid, and I drink to you, returned the doctor and to all marsh men, and may the customs never get a one of them to hang on the grisly tree of old Jack Ketch. Aye, sir. Me, I'm moving on to Portsmouth, thinking of working my passage on a man of war as ship's carpenter. Then I'll desert and get down among the brethren of the coast. You mean go pirating? I suppose as a parson I should rebuke you for such a wish. But it may interest you to know that three horsemen are heading down the hill in our direction, and their leader is riding a dappled grey very similar to mine. Sandgate swine, hissed Mipps, grabbing the blunderbuss. Attempt no such folly, retorted Sin sharply. Unless, of course, you wish to forgo all possibility of becoming a pirate. Hold these. 
He counted a handful of coins into the little man's hand, saying, Three guinea spades and two crowns. Keep them safely and yourself hidden or you'll hang. Waiting until the riders were behind a clump of trees, Dr. Sin slipped out of the bastion walls. By the time the officer had emerged, he was riding slowly towards them. The customs officer was the first to speak. Have you seen anything, sir, of a dirty-looking little rat of a man in this neighbourhood? I was about to ask you the same, sir, for he must have passed you as he went up the hill, but now... Sin turned out his empty pocket. He came upon me unawares and relieved this very pocket of three guinea pieces and two crowns. Which way did he go? Up the hill, you said? Come on, my lads, we'll ride him down yet. Followed by his assistants, the officer set his spurs to his horse and galloped off. When Dr. Sin returned to the bastion, he found his comical little companion chuckling. <laughs> well, you certainly sell them very neat, sir. <sighs> well, I must first give you the lie and return the money. No, indeed, smiled the parson. So long as you have it, I have told no lie except that you went up the hill. Use the money to get you the quicker towards Portsmouth. Were it not for my cloth and duty, I should be tempted to accompany you. Together we could rule it royally amongst the pirates. Well, sir replied Mipps, winking. If ever you should tire of your pulpit, go a voyage in and fall into my hands, I pledge you my solemn word that I will not make you walk the plank. You shall walk the poop deck with a sword at your side. Success to us both, long life for the king, and down with the customs. Dr. Sin laughed and drank the proffered toast. The ill-assorted companions parted after mutual commendations of good luck, Mipps taking the road to Portsmouth, and Dr. Sin leading his horse up the steep incline to Lim Castle. Sir Henry Pembury received his visitor in the great hall. He sat in a large armchair, his right foot heavily bandaged. I must ask your pardon for having put you to the trouble of climbing Lim Hill, but as you see, Dr. Sin, my gout prevents my travelling. Also, the nature of the request I have to put to you makes it more convenient for you to be here. But first, may I ask... When you are returning to Oxford? A week today, sir. Tony Cobtree is to ride with me. But I understood from Sir Charles that he had finished with the university. So he has, sir. He's now an attorney at law, but he's taking a proposal of marriage to the lady of his affections. That's capital, cried the squire. But to return to my business. While in Madrid recently, my wife and I were lavishly entertained by a wealthy South American family. We naturally extended to them the hospitality of Lim Castle, should they ever visit England. However, the father died suddenly, but the mother and daughter have been with us here for the last fortnight. They have some business to transact with the gentlemen of Oxford. I wonder now whether you and young Cobtree would undertake to ride as their escort. It will be an honour, sir. You will not regret it. The daughter is ravishing. Before Dr. Sen could reply, the door opened and she was standing there. The young scholar gasped in wonder. He knew that he was gazing at what he wanted more than all the world. She was simply dressed in the black mourning for her father, with a priceless mantilla crowned high and falling in cascades of lacy folds. The elegant aloofness of the young scholar in his black riding dress had arrested her in the same bewildered astonishment. Senorita, Sir Henry called, let me present Christopher Sin, a learned doctor of Oxford. Dr. Sin, this is Miss Imogen Almago. The doctor crossed the room with long, easy strides. I am greatly honoured, he said, raising her hand to his lips. Imogen smiled. I was sent by her ladyship to ask of you, Sir Henry, whether there was aught you needed before we take our usual walk around the grounds. They wait me on the terrace the peacock's walk. Then take Dr. Sin with you, child, and become better acquainted, and tell my butler that Dr. Sin is consenting to stay to dinner. Dr. Sin bowed his thanks, and then offered the girl his arm. Knowing the castle well, he took great pains to take a roundabout way to the terrace, finding to his great relief that by the time they arrived, Lady Penbury and the Spanish widow had left it solitary but for the peacocks. The young cleric, who had been so often rallied by his friend Tony for not attempting a success amongst the ladies, realised that in this beautiful girl was a cure for all his shyness. 
He knew also that in her companionship he could be more than compensated for the loss of parents and relatives that had forced his young life into a loneliness that was unnatural. By the time he exchanged greetings with the elder ladies on their return to the castle, the two young people had learned a great deal about each other. Having spent many years in Oxford and knowing the best families, Dr. Sin was interested to know what house the Spanish ladies were visiting. The daughter, who spoke better English than her mother, explained that they were bound to Ifley, on the outskirts of the town, to reside with the squire. The squire's nephew, one Nicholas Tappet, had worked under the British ambassador in Madrid. Through some unfair treatment, as the girl pointed out sympathetically, the young man had lost his post. He had enlisted the influence of Signor Almago, who provided him with a ship to carry produce to England. My dear father believed in Nicholas. Whatever trouble may have been at the embassy, we were convinced that Nicholas was not to blame. Dr. Sin, knowing something of the plausible young rascal, thought otherwise, but he kept his opinion. Hearing that Dr. Sin was acquainted with Squire Tappet, the Spanish ladies pressed him for information. Here the young doctor found himself in an awkward dilemma, for, known as Bully Tappet, the Ifley Squire was shunned by all God-fearing people in the neighbourhood. Coarse and brutally strong, with the worst reputation where women were concerned, he was the last man Dr. Sin would have wished to play host towards his newfound friend and already adored Imogen. So he answered their questions evasively, inwardly rejoicing that he was to be their escort, and determined that they should transact any necessary business with the squire of Ifley from some lodgings he knew of in the town, where he could keep watch. During dinner, where Dr. Sin sat between Lady Pendry and the Spanish girl, the latter talked so much about Nicholas Tappet that the young cleric suffered the worst pangs of jealousy. She told him how fond she was of him, how vastly he amused her. But I loved him best, oh yes, very much indeed, when he told me he was desperately in love with me and asked me to marry him. With his spirits at the lowest ebb, Dr. Sin asked her, And what did you answer? I, she whispered, why, I laughed in his face. He is a rake, my dear sir. At one time he was so serious in his protestations that he embraced the Catholic faith and was surprised such devotion did not sway me. But how could I marry a man who would forget the fact whenever he saw another petticoat in view? Also, you would not think of marrying a fool, whispered Dr. Sin, and the man who, having once seen you, could think of another woman would prove himself the worst of fools, in my thinking. That is very kindly put, but I think you are even quicker than poor Nicholas in saying the pretty thing but I have never said a pretty thing to a lady before in all my life, he replied, and except to you, I never shall. From the first moment I saw you, I knew well that I loved you. For me, there will be no other woman. Will you tell me that again when we are alone beneath the stars? Dr. Sin had taken Imogen's hand in his beneath the table, had felt an answering pressure to his own, and then seen, to his utmost joy, her lips frame the words, I love you too. And not long after, the early night stars played their romantic parts upon the terrace of the castle, so that when the last good nights were said, Dr. Sin was confident that his authority with the Spanish ladies went a little further than mere escort, for Imogen gave him cause to believe that their families were almost united. During the following week, the young cleric took Imogen to Dimchurch. Sir Charles Cobtree went out of his way to make the place attractive to her. Persuade young Christopher to marry, my dear, and then tell him to leave Oxford and retire here as our vicar. The people need a married parson. I love it all, my Christopher, Imogen whispered on the journey back to Lim. But, oh, my dear, your little churches... And your great ones, too, of the Protestant faith are so plain and dull compared with the glories of ours. But I love you, dear. I put you before religion. I do not ask you to give up your own country's faith, he answered. But I shall, and of my own free will. And yes, because of you. He was destined to remember what she said through a twenty years' odyssey of bitterness. 
However, there was no thought of bitterness during that blessed week, and certainly no bitterness in that ride back to Oxford, a long romantic journey and no mishap to mar it. Until Dr. Sin rides out to Ifley to inform the squire that his betrothed one Imogen Almago and her mother are waiting to receive him in their lodgings in Oxford. The large mansion at Ifley stood in its own grounds. A high wall ran around three sides, and the river completed the defence upon the fourth. Dr. Sin rode up to the lodge gates and rang the bell. A servant let him through and then locked the gates again. Now it so happened that the squire of Ifley had heard that Dr. Sin had forbidden his pupils to play cards or dice, and as this happened to be one of the bully's sources of income, he was enraged to see the cause of his disappointment riding up his drive. He opened the front door himself. And what the devil brings you here? I bring you a message from a lady. The devil you do, laughed the squire. Well, understand that I'm not paying compensation to any woman who has had the privilege of my attentions. You have not had the honour of meeting the lady in question, replied Dr. Sin coldly. She will receive you at Whitefriars House, St. Giles, tomorrow at noon, if you desire to interview her concerning your nephew's affairs in Spain. Are you talking of the Almago women? asked Tappet. Are they in Oxford? They are, sir. I myself have lodged them with the good woman who lets the apartments I named. But they were to come here, exploded the squire. Who are you to interfere with my schemes? Schemes, eh? repeated the doctor. I will tell you my authority. I am the prospective son-in-law to the signora. Her daughter has promised to marry me. I rather think she will marry my nephew. Dr. Sin shook his head. She has already refused him. Tomorrow at noon, sir. Good day. Oh, no, replied the squire. Not good day yet. Not till my grooms have done with you. He then bawled out, Stables, quick, all of you. Dr. Sin saw him run into the stable yard, followed by cries from the stableman, cracking of whips, and then the full-throated baying of hounds. The young man had no intention of riding into such disadvantage. He knew the gates were locked, so, turning his horse sharply to the right, he rode through the woods along the mossy path to the river. The Isis ran there, broad and wide, but it would not be the first time he had swum his horse. The current was stronger than he thought, and swept him below the opposite landing stage, but Dr. Sin headed for a meadow belonging to a little farm. The farmer happened to be out with a fowling piece under his arm and cried out, I've suffered enough from the sins of the tappet crowd. Swim back as fast as you can, lest I drill holes in you. I've just escaped from there, my good friend. Who are you then? A doctor of Queen's College, and with every cause to hate the folk behind me. The farmer immediately pointed out a spot for landing, which was no sooner accomplished than Dr. Sin was asking which was the best bridge to cross in order to come upon the road leading past the gates to Ifley Court. For reason of haste, he refused the farmer's offer that he should dry his clothes by the kitchen fire. "'I'll show you the way beyond the house,' cried the farmer. "'You can gallop it in three minutes while they'll be hunting you in the grounds. "'I'll do anything against them over there. "'I have cause enough to hate them.' Thereupon he quickly told a foul story of seduction which the squire of Ifley had carried out against his daughter. Don't rob me of revenge. I live for it, pleaded the man. Let me help you. The time is not yet ripe, but soon I may ask for your help. And with a wave of his hand and still dripping wet, Dr. Sin cantered out through the farmyard. The farmer was right. He reached the gates quickly, but so much noise was the squire of Ifley making that no one heard the rider approach. "'The coward is hiding in the trees somewhere!' the squire yelled to his stableman. "'Loose the mastiffs and let him rout him out. He can't get out of the locked gates.' "'I'm afraid he has got out all the same,' laughed Dr. Sin. The squire swung round with an oath. "'How the devil!' But Dr. Sin cut him short. "'Tomorrow, at noon.' The attorney, the ladies, and myself will await you at St. Giles. Good day. And digging his heels in hard, he let his horse out into a full gallop towards Oxford. Just before noon on the following day, Dr. Sin, Tony Cobtree, and the Spanish ladies awaited the arrival of the Squire of Ifley. 
White Friars, in which Dr. Sin had taken lodgings for the ladies, was pleasantly situated with windows overlooking St. Giles's Market. The annual fair was in full swing. With one arm circling Imogen's waist, Dr. Sin leant from the open window watching the crowds of people. Our visitor will be hard put to it in making his way through this lot. Anthony Cobtree looked up from some legal papers. He has too many enemies among the townsfolk. I'm willing to lay you a guinea, Christopher. He will not have the courage to swagger his way through that crowd. I fear you have lost, laughed the doctor. There's a coach carrying the Ifley coat of arms just turning into the market. The coachman seems to have as little regard for the crowd as his master has, for he's lashing out freely with his whip while our bully is poking his cane at them through the window. There will be trouble, I think. You idle dogs, shouted the squire. Must I teach you to give way of your betters? At this, there was a growling protest from the crowd, and a woman's voice rang out with, What happened to Esther Summers? And a score of other poor lasses, cried another. The squire flung open the door of the coach and shouted the footman to get down and lead the horses. He then drew his sword and faced his assailants. They well knew his reputation and shrank back before the naked steel. He laughed and made his way to Whitefriars. Dr. Sin ran and opened the front door. His friend followed. Now, Mr. Parson, rapped out the squire, where are the foreign women and where is this lawyer you spoke about? The young lawyer stepped forward. Let me introduce myself, sir. I am Anthony Cobtree, attorney at law, and here for the convenience and protection of two respected Spanish ladies. They are only willing to receive you as representing your nephew, Nicholas Tappet, now absent in Spain, who was involved in business ties with the late Signor Almago. These ladies now await you. Dr. Sin and myself are both busy men, so if you will follow us to the parlour above. Now, on the mention of the parlour above, the squire of Ifley lifted his quizzing glass and beheld the beautiful Imogen anxiously peering over the ledge. Is that the young filly? Dr. Sin did not reply. I have always thought my nephew a fool, continued the squire. The girl is as beautiful as she is rich. And shall such a morsel be thrown away upon such a rapacious young parson as yourself? We'll soon see to that, sir. Lead me to this charmer at once. Young Cobtree, who had overheard all and had reached the parlour first, instructed the ladies that it would not be seemly for them to curtsy or in any way greet the scoundrel, and thus it was that when Dr. Sin said, The squire of Ifley, uncle to your acquaintance, Nicholas Tappet, neither of the ladies so much as moved. Realising that he was being ignored, however, did not prevent the squire from raising his quizzing glass and surveying Imogen with audible sighs. He bowed. Although these gentlemen seem desirous to place me at a disadvantage with you, I assure you both, dear ladies, that I am ravished to meet such beauty, and would wish nothing better than to welcome you to Ifflicourt. I think, sir, put in Dr. Sin, that we can let any question of your hospitality alone. Since I have forbidden my students to visit you, I shall advise these ladies in the same manner. <laughs> I give it laughed the squire. But, ladies, since I am thus discredited, let me at least know how my fool of a nephew stands in your regard. Is he, or is he not, mentioned in this Almago's will? To which Imogen replied, Mr. Cobtree, will you proceed? Solemnly, Tony Cobtree read the terms of the late Spaniard's will. The part which touched the squire's nephew stated that the vessel which the deceased had provided for Nicholas Tappet should be still held in commission with the said Nicholas Tappet as sailing master, and that such profits accruing from any voyages should be divided between him and the deceased's daughter Imogen. This concluded the business, and Cobtree asked if anyone had any comment to make, at which the squire, much to Dr. Sin's annoyance, took Imogen's hand and kissed her fingertips. It seems, then he laughed, that my wretched nephew will at least be connected closely with you in the way of business. Will you object to that, Dr. Sin? Or will you be sensible enough to pocket the profit? I warrant it will be higher than the stipend of a parson. He bowed to the ladies and left the room.
the two young men accompanied him down the stairs. Ignoring the growl of protest against him from the crowd, the squire turned on the steps of the porch and faced Dr. Sin. As for you, sir, marry the girl if you can, but you will first answer this, and he struck the parson in the mouth. Although blood trickled from his lip, Dr. Sin appeared deadly calm. Raising his hand to check the angry murmur of the crowd, he said, You have just struck a cowardly blow. Knowing full well that it would not be seemly for me to meet you with either barrel or blade, but I have a man's heart beneath my black coat, and I take a blow from no one as despicable as you. Very deliberately, he removed his clerical coat. But the squire had drawn his sword, and with the flat of the blade struck the parson with all his force upon his shoulder. In a second, Tony Cobtree's sword was drawn. While hoots of shame and tear him arose from the crowd, Dr. Sin cried, This is my quarrel, Tony. At the same time, he leapt, dropping his coat, and struck with his fist and caught the squire with all his force upon the jaw. The sudden impact lifted the bully off his feet, and down he went backwards with a sickening thud as his head hit the cobbled stones. It was then that the crowd pounced. The squire's sword was sent crashing through the windows of his coach. The armed coachman was dragged from his box. Despite the efforts of both Dr. Sin and Cobtree to save him, the squire of Ifley was lifted up by the infuriated townsmen and bundled into his coach. The coachman and footman were pushed in after him, and then, amid wild yells of derision, they led the horses through the crowd to Maudlin Bridge. Here, as the young men were afterwards to learn, the frightened animals were left to their own devices, and the coach went off in a mad career, swaying and ungoverned. And behind them, in Oxford, the Giles Fair went on, and in the parlour of White Friars, Dr. Sin said, the squire of Ifley is going to be undone for this affair, and I rather think that I shall have most hand in it. Although the squire of Ifley ached from head to foot from his manhandling, he lost no time planning his revenge. He decided that this could best be served by striking at Dr. Sin through the beautiful Spanish girl. If he could kidnap both mother and daughter from the house in St. Giles and get them to Ifley, he could hold them prisoners until they consented to his wishes. He summoned the gatekeeper and unfolded his scheme. Mr. Cragg had no difficulty in watching White Friars nor in recognising his master's victims. There was Dr. Sin, whom he had met, with the beautiful Spanish girl. There was the mother, and the other man he knew must be the lawyer. Cragg waited. The crowded market lent him an easy concealment. Eventually, the two young men appeared at the front door with Dr. Sin bidding the Spanish girl good night. Cragg followed the doctor and his friend. When they disappeared into the Chancellor's house, he put the plot in motion. He lingered a while so that dusk should give place to night. Then he went to Whitefriars and rang the bell vigorously. The housekeeper opened the door and he handed in a note. A few minutes later he was admitted into the hall and found, just as the squire had hoped, that the Spanish girl had fallen into the trap. Her eyes were bathed in tears as she asked Cragg whether he had seen the accident. He told her, no. But he had a carriage ready to take her to see the injured gentleman. I will hasten to my mother, she said, and we will start immediately. Five minutes later Cragg was escorting them to the carriage. They drove off at speed. When they arrived at Ifley, the gates were open and they swept up the drive. The butler was waiting and he ushered them into the dining room. He reported that if the sufferer could be kept alive that night, the physician had hopes for his recovery. Two visitors the doctor could not allow, but as the reverend gentleman kept asking for Imogen, the sight of her would perhaps bring him some peace. Imogen left with the butler and followed him down a long passage. He opened a door at the far end and she went through. She found herself in a spacious oak-panelled room. She heard the door close behind her, and turning, she recognised the squire of Ifley. Where is Dr. Sin? she gasped. The squire grinned. 
Dr. Sin is well and in Oxford all the time. You are now at Ifley, and here you will stay until you have consented to my demands. Do you intend to force me to marry your nephew, sir? Spite me, no, the squire laughed. Why should I help him to what I most desire for myself? I'd rather leave my estate to our children, my dear. Our children? How dare you even think such a thing? For the same reason that I shall accomplish it. I want you for my wife, so forget your parson, little miss, and accept my wooing. Never. Oh, but you will. You will not care to see your mother tortured. We will talk for a while, and then, unless you relent, her persecution will commence. I warrant her screams will move you. Dr. Sin will find me, said Imogen coldly. Of course he will, <laughs> laughed the squire. I have written him a letter. In it I have stated that you have changed your mind and have arranged for yourself a happier match. He will come here, and when he does, he will not leave alive. Unless, of course, you so convince him that my letter is the truth. Now, will you drink a glass of wine with me on this comfortable sofa? I will not. Very well, you may stand there while I sit and drink. And in one hour you will hear your mother's first scream of pain. I have servants who are expert at that kind of treatment. There is a clock. Watch it. Meanwhile, Crag had delivered the squire's letter. It was late when the two young men left the Chancellor's and returned to Queen's. The porter gave the doctor the letter, and when he read it, his face veiled over with determined rage. That settles it. Either I or that rascal dies tonight. Read it, Tony, and wait here. Cobtree read the letter. By the time he had finished it, with many a gasp of horror, his friend stood there before him, holding a long sword. It was my father's, who was with the prince in forty-five. I, the old lawyer, died game enough, and so will I, if needs be. Come on! To the gates of Ifley, cried Tony as they galloped over Magdalen Bridge. No, we'll rouse the farmer I told you about. If he can ferry us over the Isis in his boat, we shall attack with more surprise. Although the hour was late, the farmer was in the cowshed. He recognised Dr. Sin immediately, and after hearing that his errand was in the quest of revenge, was eager to help. In the space of a few minutes, the horses were stabled, and he was leading the way through the meadow. "'I'll bring a loaded pistol, sir,' he said as they rode across the river. "'I am no gentleman and cannot use a sword, but believe me, I can shoot straight. But how do you intend to act when we touch the further bank?' "'Proceed to the house and kick up hell,' said Sin. "'I have a better plan,' replied the farmer. My brother-in-law, Charles Herman, is the most skilful cabinet-maker in Oxford. Some time back he was employed by the squire yonder to open up a sliding panel in the great oak room which the scoundrel uses for his gaming. This panel leads by a flight of winding steps to the old water gate. In his father's time it had been closed, but no doubt Bully Tappet has found it useful for his victims. Charles repaired the secret spring which operates the door and made a new key for the water gate. After the tragedy to my daughter, he told me of this secret way and I persuaded him to make me another key from the mould. And now, gentlemen, we will use it and with God's help rescue the ladies and deal with the squire. The farmer eased the boat to the bank and climbed out. He produced the key from his shirt, and by the time the door had swung silently into the darkness, the young men were standing behind him. Cautiously, they all entered, the farmer first, mounting step by step. They completed three full rings of the turret and could hear a man's voice when the farmer whispered, Back! They retreated three steps and just in time, for the panel was open. It leads to the river, said the squire's voice. I show it to you, my dear, to prove how completely you are in my power. Soon you will hear your mother scream again. My rascals are punctual. But you can stop your mother's terror. You have only to consent to me. Why not give in? Listen. There. 
do here? A piercing scream rose from a distant part of the house. Dr. Sin tried to push past the farmer, but he held him firmly back. Then Imogen spoke. God will have no mercy on you when my Christopher, Dr. Sin, arrives. He will kill you. I have tried to... The squire was interrupted by a knocking on the door. News of your mother, no doubt. When the door was opened, Imogen gasped, for there stood an enormous man holding a pair of blacksmith's pincers. Well, fool, what is it? That last nip I gave put her out, growled the brute. Throw a jug of water on her and lock her in for the night. Then mount guard in the main hall with the stable lads. If this Dr. Sin should come clambering at the doors, shut him in the dungeons. Now go and don't disturb me till morning. No matter what shrieks and screams you hear. Understand? The man nodded, and with a grin of appreciation of the terrified girl, he went out. The squire finished his wine, and now, my dear, that tempting little bodice of yours must be unhooked. Have pity. It is you who are cruel. Your beauty tortures me. Come here, you ravishing devil, and let me kiss you down to hell. Where you are bound for now, rapped out a voice behind him. The squire swung round and the blood drained from his face. He stared, mystified, at the two figures who were standing with swords drawn. May I ask the name of the servant who has betrayed my secret panel to you, parson? It is not your servants, but your sins that have betrayed you. Do you recollect a lovely young girl called Esther Summers? I see you do. She died of the shame she suffered at your hands. But since God is shortly to judge you for that, I will not dwell on that girl's tragedy. I will kill you for this, hissed the squire. He unhooked two dueling swords from above the fireplace. Choose. I choose my own sword to kill you with, replied the parson. Now for his father's sword, Sin had a great affection. As a matter of sentiment, he had not only kept it clean and sharp, but had trained his hand to use it, despite his cloth of peace. It may have been just a few minutes that the blades slithered and clanked, but in that time the squire knew that he would need his utmost skill to break down the other's guard. Furiously he attacked, but he found the young parson a swordsman the like of which he had never met before. He met his fiery attack with a rock-like defence. And soon the wine, which had helped the squire in his first dashes, began to hinder him. I rather think this is your last fight, sir, said Sin quietly, his implacable sword advancing remorselessly. And then the squire's sword fell to the floor. You have him now, cried Cobtree. The squire crouched, breathing hard. Dr. Sin retreated slowly. Pick up your sword, and you'll spit me as I do it. Had that been my way, I could have done it three seconds ago. The squire stood up wearily. Since everyone's eyes were upon him, no one noticed the farmer appear in the opening of the secret panel. The squire was about to pick up his sword when the parson said, Look behind you. Another trick? I have never tricked you, replied Sin. But it seems that other hands but mine must kill you. The squire slowly turned. A bewildered look came over his face as he tried to recollect where he had seen this man before who now faced him with a levelled pistol in his hand. He was not long in doubt. I am Esther Summer's father. I have come to put pay to your account. A flash, a deafening report, and then amidst a stench of gunpowder they saw the squire's great body crumple. Nothing moved save the curling smoke from the pistol. It was a strange voice that brought the onlookers back to a state of reality. This looks to me like murder. The speaker, who was quietly closing the door, was richly dressed. His complexion was browned from foreign sun, and his gold earrings indicated the sea as a profession. Nicholas, cried Imogen, springing forward. The squire's nephew, observed Sin to Tony, and come in the nick of time to close my uncle's eyes, it seems. He set the girl aside and surveyed the dying man. 
I hurried from Spain, dear uncle, after your letter, threatening to cut me off from the estate. However, I rather think the little misfortune which I see you in will give me the estate within the hour. I, I'm done for, whispered the squire. But had I married that girl whom you lost to the parson there, her child would have been a bar to your inheritance. What does he mean? Imogen. I am betrothed to Dr. Sin, Nicholas. My mother and I were brought here forcibly. But Christopher and Mr. Cobtree came to rescue us. Your uncle tried to kill my lover, and then the shot was fired. Nicholas looked at the man who still held the pistol. Why, it's Summers. I remember. You had a daughter. I think I heard she died. I? He killed her. So you killed him. Well, all I can say, my friend, is that you are in something of a fix. A jewel's a jewel, but murder's murder. I'll gladly swing for it. Tut, man, let's have no more corpses. While Uncle obliges me by dying as quickly as he can, I'll think what's best to do. As a reproof to his callous attitude, Dr. Sin propped the dying man into a more comfortable position. Leave me alone, said the squire, with effort. Yes, Summers, your Esther was a beautiful wench. I wonder now if I'll meet the jade. They were his last words. Well, I'll be no hypocrite, said Nicholas. I always hated my uncle. But now, gentlemen, let us see about giving him a more regular death than he enjoyed. I've no wish to see the father of Esther Summers on the scaffold. If you agree to my plan, there'll be no question of murder. At dawn tomorrow, Dr. Sin, with Mr. Cobtree as second, will meet my uncle in an affair of honour. As his nephew, I will act for him. No a surgeon in the town who, for a purse of guineas, will certify the death as regular, will play the farce in Magdalen Fields. No possible blame can fall on Dr. Sin, unless it is a rap over the knuckles from the university authorities. What do you say? The effrontery of this suggestion seemed to the others so preposterous that they first emphatically refused. But gradually Nicholas convinced them that only by such means could Summers be saved from trial. You can safely leave this to me to carry through, he said. All you have to do is escort the ladies back to Oxford and await me at dawn in the fields. Why Magdalen Fields? asked Cobtree. The pistol shots must be heard in a public place. I will bring the body by coach. The surgeon and I will lay it on the ground. Dr. Sin and I will fire the pistols into the air. The corpse will be lifted back into the coach and Summers is at liberty to stay in bed if he wishes. The servants will obey me implicitly. They hated my uncle. Now let us release your mother, Imogen. The dominance of Nicholas succeeded, and since nobody had a better plan, they agreed to carry out the grim game. They found Imogen's mother in a sad condition. They took her back to Whitefriars only half-conscious. The kidnapping, but not the squire's death, was explained to the good landlady, and Imogen and her mother were left to her care. Nicholas went to arrange matters with the surgeon. Tony Cobtree went back to Queen's College with Dr. Sin, where they kept vigil, waiting for the dawn. At the first paling of the sky, the two companions, muffled in heavy cloaks, walked briskly towards Magdalen Bridge. I just hope Nicholas Tappet does not bungle things, Tony. But whatever may be said of Nicholas Tappet, and all through his life bad things were said of him, he did not bungle things. Everything went to plan. And when the squire was back in the coach, Nicholas found a couple of gypsies by the river and gave them a guinea apiece to go to the town hall and report that Dr. Sin of Queen's had killed the squire of Ifley in a duel. As Nicholas anticipated, the news of Bully Tappet's death spread like a raging fire through Oxford. That the bully had fallen at the hands of a parson was choice news indeed, and Dr. Sin was accordingly lionised. That the parson had won the hand of a beautiful Spanish girl gave him an additional lustre, since the news had leaked out that this same beauty had been the cause of the duel. The only comfort Dr. Sin derived from this was the security of public opinion, but he found peace in his lover's arms. Promise to keep me always from harm as you did last night, 
Imogen whispered. Promise to love me always and I will. That should be easy, she replied. And when my dear mother is recovered, I will make her consent to our immediate marriage. It cannot be too soon for me. At the coroner's inquest, it was apparent to the conspirators that no hint of suspicion that a trick had been played upon them had entered the minds of the jury. A verdict of death in an affair of honour was quickly returned, and the coroner wound up the proceedings with a tribute to the young parson's courage and to Captain Tappet's impartiality. The result of the inquest brought yet more congratulations to Dr. Sin, to which he replied wistfully that he had yet to face the bishop on a charge of violating his cloth. But the bishop, not wanting to fly in the face of public opinion, pretended to be ill and begged the Chancellor to take over full responsibility. Fortunately for Dr. Sin, this important official was also his good friend. Thus was Dr. Sin acquitted, and that very night a supper was given in his honour by the students at college. Both Tony and Nicholas went with him, and the wine was more than plentiful. But neither Tony nor Nicholas could outdrink their friend, and they afterwards confessed that although he drank as much as any, he was the only one who remained sober. In the days that followed, Dr. Sin developed a fast friendship for Nicholas. Possessed now of his uncle's wealth, the young man began to enjoy life with zest and insisted that his friends share his good fortune with him. He would wave aside their continual gratitude with, I am a friend of the family, I hope. Imogen especially delighted in Nicholas's company. It was delightful to talk of her beloved Spain to someone who knew it well and could converse in Spanish. He was also a proficient performer on the guitar and could sing her favourite love songs. When Imogen's mother was well enough, Nicholas became involved in the wedding festivities. It was Tony Cobtree's idea that a double wedding would be the grandest occasion, but it was Nicholas who made all the arrangements. The invitations were sent out immediately, and at his own request Nicholas was appointed best man in attendance under Dr. Sin. He also undertook to convey the Signora back to Spain, for she had decided to return to her own people after the wedding. Nicholas proved himself a friend of the family indeed. Needless to dwell on the gay happiness of those wedding festivities, everything went with a swing. The one tinge of sadness was Imogen's parting from her mother, but it was understood that as soon as times permitted, she and Christopher would take passage with Nicholas and visit her. The days that followed were the happiest of the doctor's life. He had been granted a month's vacation from his college duties. The young couple had taken rooms at Whitefriars, and Dr. Sin was to return to Oxford work until his induction to the dim church living. The kindly old vicar allowed the young couple free access to their future home in Kent, and Dr. Sin was thus enabled to plan the various alterations which Imogen suggested for the house. Walls were to be knocked down and rooms added. Each proposal gave birth to a dozen more until the bewildered old vicar mildly remarked that they might as well pull the old house down and start afresh. Oh, no, cried Imogen. I love these whitewashed walls. They remind me of Spain. She had ideas for a Spanish alcove outside the sitting room. In the sun, if it ever shines here, we could sit under it. And when Nicholas visits us, he will be able to sing us his lovely Spanish songs. Oh, Christopher, please have one built. All this was duly explained to the builder, an old friend of the Sin family. It was Mr. Raid who opened Dr. Sin's eyes to something about Imogen which he would never have thought possible. These alterations will cost money, reverend sir, which will be wasted should your lady wife decide to move. She is no lover of our marsh, I can tell. This had never occurred to Dr. Sin. Loving the marsh as he did in all weathers, he imagined that others would feel the same appreciation for it. Soon after their return to Oxford, they received a letter from Nicholas stating that urgent business had kept him in Spain. You will be glad to know, my dear Imogen, that I escorted your dear mother safely to her home, where I see her constantly. She is completely recovered. It will amuse you to know that I am passing everywhere as Spanish-born. Owing to the political state of Europe, the English are unpopular. Signor Nicola Tapitero is the high-sounding name I have adopted. It is the only means by which I can get honest trading. For you, my dear Imogen, I have purchased a scented lace mantilla. 
For our dear doctor, I have a comical edition of Don Quevedo. Trusting to find you both still in Oxford on my return, I subscribe myself your Spanish friend of the family, Nicola Tapitero. Oh, Christopher, promise to stay in Oxford till he comes. Dimchurch seems so far away. Are you so anxious for that mantilla? Or is it Nicholas you want to see? I want to be warmed by the reflection of the Spanish sun, she answered. Though many of the students who visited the young couple were lively enough, Imogen found that Oxford people connected with the university took life very seriously. Even Dr. Zinn had adopted a gravity of manner suitable to his responsibilities. To Imogen, the subjects he taught were deathly dull, and he seemed to her to have wrapped his soul in too sombre a cloak. And unconsciously she talked so much of Nicholas and Spain that in Dr. Sin there began to grow a jealousy. Not owning this even to himself, he gave her no warning that such a thing existed. Battered by heavy seas in the Channel, Nicholas returned to Oxford but two days before the doctor and Imogen were due to leave for Dimchurch. There's no need to inquire after your happiness, Christopher, for I never saw you so gay in manner. But what has befallen Imogen? She appears mighty solemn. Dr. Sin reproved his wife for the cold attitude she was showing toward their friend. I am in a mood to be irritated by him, Christopher. He's so vastly pleased with himself. Also, I am not feeling well. On the advice of the landlady, a physician was summoned, who reported that the patient was suffering from a nervous disorder and must be confined to the house for at least a week. Dr. Sin, in his anxiety, first thought of cancelling the ceremony of his induction, but he was overruled by Imogen, and the landlady agreed to care for her in his absence. Nicholas also promised that he would ride from Ifley every day to make inquiry, which he would immediately communicate at Dimchurch by stagecoach, and so the doctor felt in a happier frame of mind. Two days later, he knelt by his wife's bed and took a loving farewell. She clung to him. Take care of yourself, dear Christopher, and promise me that nothing shall make you unhappy. So long as we love each other, nothing could, he answered. And so he left her. His welcome to Dimchurch was enthusiastic. The builders had completed the work to the vicarage, and he wrote to his wife that here was a home in which he knew they would find happiness. Nicholas was as good as his word, and each day his letters described Imogen's improvement. The great day of the induction came, and the dignitaries of Canterbury invested their well-beloved in Christ, Christopher Sin, Doctor of Divinity, to the perpetual vicarage of Dimchurch under the wall. It was arranged that he should preach his inauguration sermon upon the following Sunday, and then post back to Oxford to fetch Imogen. On the Saturday morning, the doctor was seated in the Spanish alcove, for the sun was bright and warm. Tony Cobtree arrived with a letter in his hand. More mail from our good Nicholas? asked Sin. No, better still, from Imogen. I'll leave you to read it. Some time later, Tony re-entered the vicarage garden with his wife. They approached the alcove and received a shock. Dr. Sin sat in one of the Spanish seats staring vacantly before him. All youth had gone from his face, and his cheeks were of a ghastly pallor. "'In heaven's name, what ails you, man?' cried Tony. "'I have received a letter from hell. If you have courage, read it.' Standing up, Dr. Sin handed his friend the letter. Tony read aloud, in a low, scared voice. I cannot ask forgiveness for myself, but just for my mistake. Why did I not guess that I loved Nicholas? He lives in the sun I worship, while you, with all your goodness, float in cold mists. With an aching heart for you and for myself, I have gone to follow my destiny. You will never find us. I implore you not to seek. We are already fleeing from cold England. All blame is mine, not yours. I do not matter. I have damned myself. But I could not face a life in Dimchurch mists. But that you will serve the solemn God whom you are sworn to serve is the dearest wish of one that was your wife 
called Imogen. Tony crumpled the letter, and in a voice choking with tears of rage, hissed out, God's curses on them both. As Tony Cobtree was reading Imogen's letter to Dr. Sin, the treacherous Nicholas was lovingly lifting Imogen over the bullocks of his ship in the London River. And long before the stricken husband woke to face his dismal future, the sails were filled with the winds that were to carry the guilty pair to Spain. Imogen took refuge in the cabin. Sure of her now, and knowing that she could not change her mind, Nicholas left her there. Towards evening, he was carried back to the cabin in a drunken stupor. Disgusted, Imogen went up on deck. She stared towards land as the ship swept on through the Strait of Dover. You'll be on our tack shortly, said the sailing master. You must take your last glimpse of England, lady. I never saw the coast so clear. Do you see that long bank there? She nodded. Can you see those two figures? No, there are three. Look through my spyglass. You think you could speak to them? What part of England are we looking at? They call that bank Dimchurch Wall. Imogen gasped, recognising the lonely figure there. Indeed, some time before, Tony and his wife had seen Dr. Sin leave the house, and fearing his dangerous mood, they followed. He reached the sea wall and stood watching the white canvas of the full-rigged ship. Slowly, he raised his arm and pointed to the vessel. Then did the same unspoken sentence echo in their brains. It is the ship. Ringed in the powerful glass, Imogen saw the accusing finger point. With a cry of anguish, she fell swooning to the deck. That night, Dr. Sin sat in the courthouse dining room and drank. Tony sat with him. You're young, Christopher. Forget all this. Stick to your work. I am a dead man, Tony. And being dead... I shall have no fear in dying, and so my adventuring can be as reckless as I will. I intend to go to hell itself, rifle its molten terrors, and pour them into that man's soul. I'll follow him through countries and continents, through uncharted seas, and I'll get him in the end. There, Tony. I have sworn my oath. And with that he went to his room. A few hours later, when Tony entered the breakfast room, he was astonished to find Dr. Sin already there, conversing with his usual charm to old Sir Charles about the trend he was to take in his sermons that very morning. After his outburst to Tony, Dr. Sin spoke to no one of his tragedy, and no one questioned him. When the ordeal of that Sunday's work was over, he told his friend, And now my odyssey begins. You're leaving England? Not yet. There must be no haste. That devil with his damned guitar and Spanish songs expects me as a man of spirit to sweep to my revenge. I shall not sweep to please him, but creep to it. Yes, inch by inch along the million miles if needs be. I have loved as maybe only you could love, Tony, but I have lost. And now I chase another mistress, and I find her most alluring. Her name is Revenge. Dr. Sin continued to reside with the Cobtrees. At the vicarage he installed a married parson who could act as his curate and be ready to take over his duties when he set out on his vengeance. The Cobtrees never dared ask him when this might be, and as the months went by, they hoped he might in time forget. But all the while the doctor was preparing. In Sandgate, he discovered a Spanish prisoner living on parole. He struck a bargain with this gentleman to teach him Spanish. He promised that as soon as he was proficient, he would pay this exile's ransom and get him back to Spain, and the Spaniard was well acquainted with San Sebastian. This was important, for the doctor knew it to be the port of lading for his enemy's ship. At last there came the day when the Spaniard said, Your conversation is as good as any Spanish gentleman I know. Then I can wind up my business here, replied the doctor, 
I've already settled yours, so the sooner we set sail for San Sebastian, the better. Captain Esnada, for that was the Spaniard's title, begged him to stay in his company at his daughter's house upon arrival. Liking him well, the doctor readily consented. After handing over his full duties to the worthy curate, Dr. Sin preached his last sermon, took leave of the cob trees, and in the company of Esnada took the coach to London. From there they made their way to Amsterdam, where they found passage on a merchant ship bound for San Sebastian. The young doctor still retained his black cloth suit, but he changed his white tabs of office for a lace cravat. Also, he had buckled on his father's sword, so that on the whole he looked more like a sedate young gentleman of means than a peace-pledged parson. On arrival in San Sebastian, Dr. Sin looked eagerly for his enemy's ship, but a port official told him that Nicholas had sailed that morning for Lisbon and would be returning with cargo. The house to which Captain Esnada led Dr. Sin stood high above the harbour and commanded a fine stretch of sea, so that when upon the balcony, the doctor was able through a powerful telescope to watch any vessel that topped the horizon. It was one midday when Dr. Sin was drinking sherry with Esnada and his daughter in their cool upper room that he saw a sail appear on the horizon. In three strides he was at the telescope. The unspoken sentence that had stuck in his throat on Dimchurch Wall now passed his lips. It is the ship. By the time the vessel approached the harbour entrance, Dr. Sin and Esnada were striding through the crowds on the quayside. Suddenly Esnada heard him draw his breath. He's there on the poop, leaning against the bullock. Instinctively the Spaniard loosened his scabbard. Remember this is my quarrel, said Sin. He drew a spyglass from his pocket and brought his enemy nearer. This tapitero was a true tappet of Ifli. For the rascally fool is as drunk as an owl. But I fancy the sight of me will sober him. Do you see a woman in the bows? asked Esnada. Round spun the spyglass. For a few tense seconds, Sin said nothing. Then he whispered, It is she, my wife. At that instant, Imogen saw him and gave a cry of terror. He is there, Nicholas. He is waiting to kill us, the figure in black. I tell you, it is Dr. Sin. Frightened by the vehemence of her terror, Nicholas jerked himself into soberness. Springing at his sailing master, he cried out to bout ship. The sharp and ringing orders were promptly answered, and the ship, dangerously swinging round in a space that was hardly adequate, all but crashed into the quay. Santa Maria, what is wrong? shouted the harbour master. But the sails were already unfurled again, and she was heading away to sea. Dr. Sin turned to Esnada and smiled, but the smile was very grim. I'm glad there was no kill today, for I think this is the method of torture to employ. Our Captain Tapitero was obviously afraid, but he must put into some port, and from that port he must sail. We must get a system of spying on him, my good Esnada. With the harbour master's help, Esnada was enabled to get in touch with agents in ports throughout Spain. No sooner was the Santa Maria's destination known, but the doctor would set off to await its arrival. But Nicholas was cautious. He was also very much afraid and the certainty of seeing that elegant figure in black forever standing upon the end of every harbourage he sought got on his nerves. Eventually, the Santa Maria disappeared. Month after month went by, and to all inquiries the agent's answer was, no news. After a year they answered, finally, she is posted among the lost. But this Sin refused to believe. He told Esnada, it was only a question of waiting. And while he was waiting, Sin added the Portuguese language to Spanish and brushed up on his French. And then at last news came. A native of San Sebastian returned home from the Americas. He had been a member of the Santa Maria's crew, but had left her in Charleston when she was sold. The owner, Black Nick, had bought a shallower craft to trade upriver. Oh, yes, the owner's wife was with him, with her child, a boy. The sailor went on to speak of Black Nick's bad habits, drinking, and the worst brutality. 
A few days later, Sin wrote to Tony Cobtree, And so I go to America. It is the only thing I can do. Perhaps I am called to convert the Red Indians, who knows? Or perhaps they will convert me. A month later, having taken a sorrowful farewell of his Spanish friends, he crossed into Portugal and sailed from Lisbon on the Intention, a cargo vessel bound for Boston, Massachusetts. The Intention was not a fast ship, but Sin was in no haste. It pleased him to think that his following would be slow and relentless. The captain, a New Englander, was the poorest sort of man, maudlin in his cups and miserable out of them. And the crew were a mixed set, for since the original crew had deserted, the very sweepings of the Portuguese slums had been pressed into service. Besides Sin, the passengers were a handful of merchants. It was in the mid-ocean that they fell in with the pirates. The passengers had been grumbling about the slowness of the vessel, but the captain blamed the lack of wind. But then another vessel appeared on the horizon and was soon fast overhauling the intention. They fly the English flag, said Sin. But as the ship tacked nearer, the English flag was struck and in its stead went up the dreaded Jolly Roger. Pirates, cried the passengers. It seems, gentlemen, remarked Sin calmly, that we're faced with a fight. He turned to the captain. We are under your orders. But the captain was already hauling down the colours. I shall not be the last to turn pirate. And then, on that quiet sea morning, a pandemonium arose. Boats were lowered from the pirate ship, and soon the deck of the intention was alive with the rascals. They were led by a gigantic negro, gaudily dressed, who cried out that he was Black Satan, the captain of the good ship Sulphur Pit. Come down and do homage, you lost souls, he cried. Led by the craved New Englander, the Portuguese obeyed promptly and knelt before him. I am the captain of this ship, faltered the New Englander. I can navigate. Black Satan spat in his face. You navigate? I never saw such handling of a ship. Take him below, my bullies, and see that he shows you the ship's treasures. And you others, run out the black plank. The funeral plank, my lovers. Empty their pockets and let them walk. Tie their eyes with their own handkerchiefs. Then, amidst the cheers of the pirates, the black plank was run out over the water. Blindfolded, the prisoners were hustled along the quaking bridge. Steered by cutlasses on either side, they reached the end and fell into the sea. There, they were used as target practice. By this time, the craven captain was brought back from below, behind a procession of robbers laden with sea chests which were lowered into the boats. Now, one of those chests was Dr. Sin's. Careful with that, you dogs, he cried in Spanish. See to it that I find it safe when I come over with your captain. Thinking he must be a grandee who had struck a bargain with Black Satan, they called back, Si, sí, senor. By now, the whimpering captain of the intention was being dragged along the plank. At the end, he turned and pleaded with the pirate leader, tears of terror raining down his cheeks. Dr. Sin's gorge rose, and he drew one of his pistols. This was too undignified. Sin took careful aim and fired. The body crumpled and slipped into the sea. And who the devil are you? demanded the astonished pirate captain, seeing Sin for the first time. With a bellow of rage, he leapt down on the well deck, swinging his cutlass. What was his astonishment, however, when he found a calm and elegant gentleman waiting for him with a thin blade, which somehow all his lashings could not pass? The captain swung his heavy cutlass murderously, but with little skill, and Sin's sword drove him back. At last, the gangplank was behind him. A little to your left now, said Sin calmly. Excellent fellow. And inch by inch, he pressed him out till they were both on the plank balancing as they fought. But then the pirate quickly turned and jumped. Sin kept his balance till the board ceased to vibrate. Then, quite calmly, he took off his shoes and threw them on the deck. As his coat, scabbard and pistols followed, he noted that a dying man upon the deck was drinking from a rum bottle.
But at that moment his eyes glazed and his teeth bit through the neck. This incident gave Sin the inspiration to sing a shanty. Oh, here's to the feet what have walked the plank, yo-ho, for the dead man's throttle. And here's to the corpses afloat in the tank and the dead man's teeth in the bottle. Then he dived into the sea, his sword straight before him. The pirate captain was a slow, clumsy swimmer, and he soon felt the prick of Sin's blade upon his shoulder. In desperation, he turned, trod water, and slashed with his cutlass, trying to beat the blade from Sin's grasp. Suddenly, Sin was aware that a pirate from the sulphur pit was jumping to the rescue of his captain. With a long knife between his teeth, he swam rapidly towards them. Sin knew that the two men would be too much for him and he must kill the captain first. It was then that a cry of horror was raised from the pirates on both ships, for the great fin of a man-eating shark, attracted by the feast of corpses, came skimming towards the two combatants. Sin, knowing that the other pirate was striking out rapidly behind him, seized the crest of a swell and with a tremendous effort drove his sword down straight at his opponent. As Black Satan sank, the legitimate pirate of the seas swept at him and the great jaws opened and snapped. There was a track of reddened water as the shark sank with his prize. One of his enemies disposed of, Sin turned to face the other, the pirate with the knife. He trod water and waited. His new opponent came nearer with a grin. He then trod water like sin, and taking the knife from between his teeth, said, Good morning. Sin laughed. He liked the rascal's sense of humour. I've a score to settle with you, said the pirate. For killing your captain? Black Satan had his qualities, but he wouldn't have lasted long. I'd already planned a mutiny against him. But now as to our score. It's a long cry from here to Romney Marsh, and I owes you a little matter of three spade guineas and two crowns. I promise that if you gave up the pulpit, Dr. Sin went a voyage in and fell into my hands, you should not walk the plank. By God, it's Mips! Quite right, sir. <laughs> and very pleased to meet a sinner lid this bright morning in mid-ocean. Give us your hand, sir, and how do you do? <laughs> and now let's get back to the ship before the old shark comes back. Then, side by side, they swam back towards the pirate ship, Mips bawling out to the men to stand by for two ruddy admirals coming aboard. They climbed the rope ladder none too soon, for the shark was back again. But Mips cared nothing for sharks. He was bent on getting a favourite reception for his one-time patron. Black Satan's dead, my lads, he cried. And it's my gallant friend here who saved us from a bloody mutiny. Now, I can vouch right here and now for this man. You've seen him fight. His name's Sin, and Sin's as good a name as Satan. Used to be a parson till he couldn't stomach it no more. <laughs> so he came out here to find me and the way to go a pirating. He's willing to join us. And when you know him better, you'll say we're lucky to get him. So, serve the grog, then for the plunder, then we'll vote for a new leader. Faith, the sooner you serve me with rum, said Dr. Sin, the sooner I'll get the stench of that damned shark out of my innards. The quartermaster produced two bottles, one of which he handed to Mips and the other to Sin, saying, You've earned your drinks this morning, but have a care. Tis strong stuff for a parson. Sin laughed and then tilted the raw spirit down his throat till the bottle was empty. Mips was still drinking his, but Sin took it from him in the most engaging manner and finished it. This touch of comedy appealed to the pirates, and in a few minutes they were drinking to their new brother's health. The crew was widely recruited from many lands, and when they found this stranger could speak to them each in his own tongue, their admiration knew no bounds. I said we'd strut to the poop deck, whispered Mips, and it looks as though you'll be made captain willy-nilly. And Mips was right, for after the intention had been sunk, votes were taken for the post of command, and it was Mips and Sin who carried it. Theirs was to be a joint leadership, Mips maintaining his post as sailing master, with Sin in command of fighting tactics. They now occupied the captain's cabin. 
but Mips insisted on slinging his hammock outside the cabin door. I know my station, sir. He was above me on the marshes and is so here. I always knew I was born for adventure, and you helped me get to it with that loan. And I've got it for you here, sir. Mips produced a small parcel from his sea chest. On it was scrawled Mips, his debt to Parson Sin. Sin laughed. If your life changed that morning on Lim Hill, why, so did mine. But my change was for the worse. That's why I journey to America, and I confess that as soon as we touch land I shall put this ship behind me. There is a man I have to kill. That is my great adventure. As to the money, it was a gift. I never takes nothing for nothing, sir. Then give me something in exchange, some trifle. Very well, sir, said Mips seriously. I'll give you something in exchange, if you'll accept it. And this thing is myself. Just this, Mr. Mips, you see before you. We're bound for a rough country, sir, where a gentleman like yourself needs a servant. Well, what do you say, sir? You mean you'll give up piracy? I mean I'm going to help you kill this man, whoever he may be. I'll tell you who he is, and now, said Sin, and immediately recounted the whole business of his marriage and betrayal. At the end, Mips cried out, The dirty dog! He won't be a happy tappet by the time we deals with him. So is the business of sale complete, sir? Here's my hand on it, my good Mips. Within a few days, Sin had established a stricter discipline than any pirate ship had ever boasted. The men respected him because they feared him, and they sprang to his orders with a will. Besides this, he brought luck to the sulphur pit. Prize after prize fell to them. Rich merchant ships whose wealth increased the pirate's shares beyond the dreams of the most covetous. In every attack, Sin led the boarding party to victory, and the pirates worshipped him for his bravery and skill. Much to their relief, they never fell in with any English ship, for Sin and Mips had made it clear that they would never countenance the plank for English sailors. To all other crews, however, they were merciless. No one was left alive to tell their tales sure. But Sin had no intention of postponing his vengeance for too long. The ship's bottom was growing too foul for any speedy manoeuvring, he told the pirates, and they ought to lie up in some river for careening. And the pirates were keen on some carousing ashore. It was decided to run for the St. John's River north of Florida, Dr. Sin volunteering to sail with Mips in one of the ship's boats to find out if all was safe. "'How do we know you'll return?' objected one of the pirates. Sin laughed. Neither Mips nor I have shown ourselves dissatisfied, I think, and we'll leave our share of the treasure in the cabin. We'll hardly abandon that. This satisfied the crew, and the course was set. The winds being light, it took them two weeks to reach their anchorage. Calling all hands, Sin complimented them on their behaviour and said the time was now ripe for a royal drinking bout. We've been temperate, my lads, too long. Drink as much rum as you can stomach, and Mips and I will sail up river at dawn. The rascals needed no second bidding to attack the rum casks. In an hour they were very drunk. Mips had stored their sea chests, fresh water and provisions in a boat. It had not attracted attention from the pirates, who were satisfied that both leaders had left their share of the plunder. But when Sin stepped into the cabin to take a last look round, he saw that their treasure had disappeared. The rascals have moved it, he said to Mips. I put it in the boat, sir. No use being too honest with dishonest men. You get going, sir, and I'll follow. Sin went ahead. For some minutes he waited, and thinking something must be wrong, was about to climb aboard again when Mips reappeared. A little matter I had to see to, sir. Ready? Cast off. Sin took the tiller and Mips fell to the oars, pulling vigorously. "'Conserve your strength, man,' advised Sin. "'There's no need of such haste. "'And what's more, since we're not watched by those drunken swine, "'we'll head up the coast, straight to Charleston.' When they were safely round the head of the river, 
Mips sighed with relief. No danger now, sir. But I was very anxious to get away from the ship. You never know with all those drunken dogs about, in the magazine so full of powder. The words were hardly out of his mouth when the sky was reddened with flame and a mighty roar rolled over the sea. Good God, man, that's the ship, cried Sin. Must be. It ain't the 5th of November, certainly. Mips. When I was waiting in the boat, did you go into the magazine? Yes, sir. And unfortunately, I must have left a lighted candle there. And a train of gunpowder too, no doubt, Sin said grimly. Dead men tell no tales, sir, said the little man. The two hundred miles to Charleston were navigated in less days than they had hoped possible, and during the journey they concocted a ringing true story that Sin was to carry to the governor of the town. And the governor showed much commiseration at the hardships which the pirates had inflicted upon the young parson and his faithful servant. But he was overjoyed on learning that Black Satan and his ship had gone to their last account, and invited Dr. Sin to stay with him in his house. And the doctor learned much about his enemy, Black Nick, from the governor. At first the fellow had been liked well enough, but then his trading upriver failed and he became connected with many scandals, both in trade and private life. Eventually he had left for Albany to try his hand at trading with the Indians on the Hudson River. Three days later, Dr. Sin took his leave, armed with a letter of introduction to a cousin of the governor's in Albany, a colonel in the military. On arrival, Sin took lodgings in the best inn, then deposited the bulk of their treasure in the vault of an English banking house. From the governor's cousin, he learnt that Nicholas had set out by canoe to trade with the Indian tribes. He had taken Imogen and the boy as well as an Indian interpreter and guide. For weeks they waited patiently for his return, during which time Dr. Sin, by preaching from principal pulpits of the town, gained respect and popularity. But then a letter arrived from the governor of Charleston bringing disquieting news. After the usual courtesies to the young parson, the letter went on to state that there had been one other survivor from the explosion on the sulphur pit. He is a mulatto, an ugly devil with deathly white hair. He understands no English and has lost the power of speech from the shock of the explosion. He arrived here in the most deplorable condition, half starved. I have lodged him in the jail where my surgeon is attending him in the hope of recovering his speech. Both Sin and Mips remembered the man. He could upset our story, said Sin. We must not forget that he knows me as the parson who turned pirate. Sin must disappear. I'll tell my friends here that I have had a solemn call to preach the gospel to the Redskins. Three days later, Dr. Sin took leave of his friends in Albany and with Mips and their Indian guide, Mountain Cat, set a northern course up the Hudson. They'd been travelling for many miles one day when Mountain Cat suddenly put his finger to his lips, commanding silence. Then, in the distance, above the noise of the river, they heard war cries. They hid among the rocks. At last, the sun went down and Mountain Cat decided to spy out the situation. But when the moon arose, and the guide had not returned, Sin and Mips decided to go in search of him. The undergrowth was breast high, and it was actually dawn before they crawled over a hillock in the forest and looked down upon a clearing. It was evident that here had been a village, but all that remained were smouldering habitations. In the centre of this grim arena was a naked Indian tied to a tree. Around the clearing were ranked more than a hundred warriors. A feathered and war-painted brave was inspecting them. Then he selected five and signalled to the rest who disappeared into the woods. The brave then advanced to the bound man and severed the cords. The victim had his back to Sin and Mips, but they were certain it was Mountain Cat. Those five rascals are to be his executioners, whispered Sin, but I think we can tackle them. The chieftain then handed the victim his own tomahawk and then walked back to the warriors. 
He is allowing him the right to defend himself, whispered Sin. But then they saw the prisoner step forward to swinging the tomahawk and with a mighty effort hurl it through the air. It struck the chieftain with terrific force between the shoulder blades and he fell to the ground. At the sudden killing of their chief, the warriors danced in a frenzy towards his slayer. Now, Mips, you to his right, I to his left. Pistols first, then steel. No quarter, eh? asked Mips as they ran. None. The whirling frenzy of the five did much to help the surprise attack of the Englishman. They both brought down two apiece. The middleman rushed at the Indian, and had not Sin's blade darted in between his ribs, the chieftain's death must have been avenged. As it was, the rescued Indian received a bad flesh cut as his attacker fell dead. By gad, said Sin, it's not Mountain Cat. Mountain Cat scalped, said the Indian. Me knew him. Speak English both. Me... Shoshuga, mean blue heron, son of chief, two mile here. He pointed in the direction taken by the warriors. Them bad men may return. This way, quick. When they had gone about a mile, they once more heard the war cries of the warriors. Shoshuga pointed to a thick clump of bushes. We crawl through them, he whispered. Secret trail. The Indian began to crawl through upon his stomach, followed by Sin and Mips. Presently, they heard the lowing of cattle mingled with war cries, and at the same time reached a summit overshadowed by trees. Peering down, they looked upon a grassy plateau where some two hundred head of cattle were grazing. From the height where they crouched, they could see the attacking force awaiting the order to advance in the shelter of a dried-up river. It was then that Mips pointed to Shishuga's blood-stained bandage. Here, look at that big beast, Shushi mate. The Indian looked at his leg and saw what was to the others a large horsefly. He picked up the insect and with a triumphant smile said, It is the Clegg. Terrible fellow too. You shall see what he can do. Look. He flung it towards the cattle. They saw it flying and heard its buzz. Panic seized them. This fly was their worst enemy, for it sucked their blood and caused maddening irritation. Bellowing in panic, they stampeded for the riverbed, right towards the warriors. The defending Indians, seeing what had happened, hurled themselves towards their trampled enemy. In a few minutes, their victory was complete. Your mountain cat is avenged, said Shushuka. He gave the cry of the heron, and the three made their way to the village. That evening, Shishuga's father, the chieftain, laid on a great feast for the Englishmen. They were made blood brothers of the tribe. Just as they were retiring for a much-needed rest, Sin said, I have found my new name, Mips. When Sin disappears, I shall live on as one Clegg. I shall drive Nicholas into a panic just as that fly drove the cattle before him. How do you fancy serving Captain Clegg? The next part of Dr. Sin's Odyssey is best described in a letter he penned to Anthony Cobtree. As things befell, however, caution persuaded him to keep it in his sea chest. My dear Tony, I am writing from the whale ship Ezekiel. Many moons ago I told you of our adventures with the Redskins, You'll have read how my blood brothers got news of Nicholas and of how Shashuga, your humble servant, and my faithful Mips set out upon his trail. We followed him to New Bedford, Massachusetts. On reaching the port, we watched one of the whale ships, the Isaiah, casting off. Then, at the local inn, we made inquiries about Nicholas. Well, would you credit it? The Isaiah has been purchased by Nicholas, and we had seen her sail not knowing that he was aboard. At first I could have wept for rage, but my philosophy told me that I, too, must buy a share in some other ship and follow. We journeyed to Nantucket, and there I struck a bargain with a famous family of the trade. On the ship Ezekiel, I sailed as half-owner for the voyage. On this good ship we have now been to sea for two years. We have killed fine whales around Good Hope, and are now back after sperm whale in the Pacific. Two days later, Tony, for we have been hard-driven cutting up a mighty animal, a forty-barreled Jonah. 
but we were towed far out of sight of our ship. As the night set in, Shishuga saw a white canvas on the horizon. We took this to be our ship, but our oarsmen contradicted us. A New Englander she may be, but not from our port, you can tell by the set of her. We all devoutly hoped that he was right, for she turned away from us. But as the sun came up the next morning, so did the sails of the Ezekiel, and we were safe. I left the cutters at work to take a glass of grog with the captain. He had a story to tell. While waiting for the breeze, he had sighted the ship we had seen. Aye, oh, my good Tony, let me anticipate your guess. She was the eyes Isle. But let me tell you the captain's words. She signalled us for a gam. A high seas courtesy call, Tony. They lowered the boat, and, much to my amazement, a woman came with the captain, his wife. She was very beautiful, and still but a girl. The captain was pleasant enough, and had done well for himself. I asked him if he had seen your whaleboat. It was as I talked about you that his wife seized his arm and whispered. At once, a cold fear seemed to possess them both, and they insisted on leaving. The captain's name, I had learned earlier, was Nicholas Tappet. Tony, had I not chased the whale, I could have harpooned him in the cabin of the Ezekiel, in front of her eyes too. But I learned further things from my captain. Nicholas has subjected the whole of his body to the torture of the tattooist. It will make inquiries after him the easier. He is no more for whaling, apparently. He sees great promise in piracy, I gather. So, who knows, Tony, but that your college friend, so blinded with hate, may not also hoist the Jolly Roger and, like a lone shark, prey on ships till I can kill him. Four years after the Ezekiel had sailed from Nantucket, she returned laden with the riches of many a great whale. When Sin and Mip sailed for New Bedford, they were richer men. After so long at sea, Shoshuga returned to his people, but he wanted a rendezvous for when he was ready to rejoin Sin. Mips supplied the very place. There was a thriving tavern in Santiago called the Staunch Brotherhood. The landlord was a discreet man who could keep a secret as long as he was paid to do so. On their journey through the islands, Sin discovered that Nicholas had also gone to Santiago. Which shows, said Mips, that he has turned pirate. It's the chief occupation of that there town. On their arrival, Sin found the staunch brotherhood to be a large, rambling inn. He swaggered through the noisy crowd and demanded that the landlord, Pedro, show him the best apartment. My best apartment is very fine, returned Pedro. So fine, I must charge one gold piece to show you. Travellers must pay and landlords must live, said Sin, pleasantly. Here are two gold pieces. Lead the way. Pedro winked at his friends and led the strangers to a set of well-furnished rooms. I'll take them, said Sin. That is not possible, said the landlord suavely. You pay to see the rooms, but they are taken by a rich customer of mine. Faith, sir, if this is a jest, you will find the laugh against you. Indeed, I have taken the rooms. But you see those two chairs, senor? They belong to the occupier, who has gone with his wife and son to view the ship he has had built. He's an ugly man to cross, this great captain. A grim smile crossed Sin's lips. An ugly man to cross, eh? Well, so am I, and should this captain be tattooed from head to foot, he'll find me yet the uglier. Black Nick has very many tattoo marks, said Petro. But, senor, tell Black Nick when he returns that others have the habit of taking what does not belong to them as well as he. He'll understand. May I tell him your name, senor? Clegg. Captain Clegg. Now, help my man out with those chests. We are going to get our baggage. 
Here is gold enough to carry our credit for some days. And he threw a handful of gold pieces on the table. While Nips went to engage porters, Sin approached a group of richly dressed adventurers who were seated outside a wine shop. He told them he was Captain Clegg in Santiago on shipping business and asked if they knew a Captain Nicholas Tappet who went by the name of Black Nick. I am under commission for Captain Nicholas, said the youngest of the men. That is his ship anchored in the harbour. He had her built. She is superb. He has a genius for ships, though not a genius for dealing with men. I am first mate. I have a full crew aboard, and not one of them who is not discontented. The ship has been ready to sail these last four days, but Black Nick is transacting business with a planter from Havana. We are sailing consort with one of his ships. Where will I find Black Nick? He's at the governor's house outside the town. We went there this morning with his wife and son. I'm now bound for the staunch brother Houdin, where he promised to leave orders. It is where I'm lodging, said Sin. Perhaps you will accompany me there. Arrived at the inn, Pedro led Sin aside. You'd scarce left when they returned. They saw you on the quay. I explained about their rooms, but they cut me short and were in the greatest hurry. They packed the trunks, and then Black Nick gave orders that Juan Targona, whom your honor is with now, was to see their baggage upon his ship, the San Nicolas, and wait for them to board tomorrow. They asked me to say nothing of this to you, and you in turn will say nothing to Senor Tarragona. I will give him his captain's orders. I'll be leaving here today, but if during my absence an American Indian called Blue Heron should ask for me, you will tell him I am aboard my ship, the Imogen. After making Pedro repeat the instructions, Sin sent him to order two horses to journey to the governor's. Then he rejoined Tarragona. Black Nick left messages for both of us with the landlord. You are to take his baggage aboard the St. Nicholas, and mine as well, for I am to sail with you to Havana. He will join us in two days. But further delay will cause him mutiny, cried Tarragona. Leave it to me. I'll ride out to the governors and talk to Black Nick. Now, what like is the ship we can sort? There again, cried Tarragona. Somehow the news is out amongst my crew that we are to take this treasure ship, the Santa Mariana, to Spain. To speak frankly, the men are pirates of the worst type, and this voyage with little profit to them seems too peaceful an order. Sin nodded. Go back to your ship and tell the crew they have a good friend in me. Every man shall have a share of the profits. You may tell them that if there is one man that Black Nick fears, it is Captain Clegg, who sails with them and knows how to respect good sailors. After seeing Sin and Mips ride off towards the governors, the young officer rushed off to his ship. Meanwhile, hidden beneath the trees of a grassy bridle path, Sin drew rein. Now we've less than two hours before boarding our ship. Our ship? asked the bewildered Mips. Sin laughed. You have ever the taste for piracy, my good Mips. Well, here I find Black Nick obliging enough to build us a ship for that purpose. Within the two hours, Sin was climbing aboard the St. Nicholas, followed by Mips. Tarragona received them. Ship ready for sea? asked Sin. All ready, Captain Clegg. Then pipe all hands on deck. I have something to say to the men. Sin climbed to the poop deck and leant upon the rail. The crew swarmed on deck and stood staring at the magnificent stranger who boasted to be their friend. My lads, he said, I have had a serious difference over this voyage with Black Nick. Although he has engaged a pirate crew, he had no intention of hoisting the black flag. Well, we are going to hoist it now. And if Black Nick thinks we are going to escort the treasure ship tamely to Spain, he is mightily mistaken. The treasure will be more valuable in our own sea chests. It was I, Captain Clegg, 
who captured the sulphur pit and filled her with the treasures from our prizes. And from now on, I promise you that I'll be the first to board any ship that we think is worth the taking. So, let's serve out the grog and get to sea. What say you? At this, the whole crew fell to cheering, and someone went below and brought up the Jolly Roger. Splendid, cried Sin. Mr. Tarragona, since our course is nor'east, we'll pass the governor's house, and when we're abreast of it, sir, run up that flag. At the same time, let him have a governor's salute. Aye, a broadside of the lee guns. Now, my lads, hoist the jib. In the governor's house. His Spanish Excellency and his guests, Black Nick and a red-haired Scottish planter named McCallum, played cards and drank. Black Nick's wife sat with a handsome, slim boy on the sofa. Suddenly, a crash of thunder shook the house. Rushing out upon the balcony, they saw that the sea wall of the garden was shattered and a great ship was passing close in shore. It's my ship, cried Black Nick. They're hauling down the flag. And running up the black flag. Pirates! shouted the governor. Oh, God, Nicholas, it's Christopher! Imogen burst into tears. That night, Black Nick fled in panic, leaving his wife and son behind in a convent. He shipped aboard a pirate vessel and sailed for North America. His only thought was to escape Dr. Sin. The Scottish planter did not take things so tamely. He rode up the coast to where his treasure ship was awaiting the St. Nicholas. But he was too late. He arrived to be told by the captain of the Santa Mariana that Captain Clegg, who had command, had ordered him to hand over the treasure chests. I'll have this Clegg hanged as a pirate, cried the planter. He will not hide from me. But Clegg had no intention of hiding. He sailed back to Santiago, sank a ship in the harbour, and then rowed ashore and impudently demanded 20,000 pieces of gold, or he'd destroy the town. He also ordered the governor to hand over Black Nick. The governor raised the money, but assured Clegg that Black Nick had gone, with the planter, he thought, to Havana. So, Clegg sailed for Havana. After sending a broadside into the terrified town, he once more demanded payment, threatening to destroy the town if the money was not forthcoming in six hours. McCallum, one of the richest men in Havana, was summoned by the governor. He was no coward, and had not the same dread of Clegg as Nicholas. I will deliver the money to Clegg, he said. I will then lure him to my plantation under the pretext of delivering Black Nick into his hands. I'll tell him of his enemy's fear of him, and the thought of settling his account will be too good to resist. He will come, and I will have the military there to arrest him. They discussed the plan in detail, and that evening McCallum was rowed aboard the St. Nicholas. As he approached, he saw that the name was being changed. The ship was now the Imogen. Having paid the ransom, McCallum came straight to the point. He told Clegg that he had no love for Black Nick and that he would deliver him into Clegg's hands. The next day, according to their arrangements, Sin was rowed ashore to the plantation. The planter was there to meet him and said that to avoid suspicion the crew should stay with the boat. Now, Sin was alert for any treachery, but seeing an opportunity to impress his men with his utter disregard for danger and somehow trusting in his own destiny, he did not care and walked gaily with McCallum to the house. This was a large wooden bungalow built high upon a slope. The host showed him into a spacious living room with a table laid for three. If you sit there with your back to the door, Black Nick will not see you in that high back chair. When he heard footsteps behind him, Sin never but doubted that this was his enemy. He was then somewhat astonished to be confronted by a Spanish officer, fully armed, and three soldiers. McCallum laughed. It is quite true, Captain Clegg, that Black Nick is afraid of you, so much that he ran away to sea as a pirate. But I am not afraid. You do not steal my ship and go free. Sin rose and drew his sword. As he quickly weighed up his chances, he noticed blue smoke curling between the floorboards. 
I can assure you that my men will rescue me. That is for us to prevent, said the officer. As he spoke, he staggered back for a flame leapt through the floor while screams of fire echoed through the house. But that was not so terrifying as the half-naked figure which dashed into the room and with a double swing of a tomahawk severed the heads of the two soldiers nearest to Sin and then leapt upon the table crying out, Shushuga! Shushuga! echoed Sin with a mighty laugh, driving his sword into another soldier. I scalp you! cried the redskin, swinging a blow at the officer. The planter escaped to the woods and then with a shout the faithful Mips rushed through the smoke with the boat crew. I fired house, said Shushuga. Heard that officer talk last night about trap for you. Came to help you. That night, the pirates sacked Havana. Then they set sail. The suitable island was found, and from this secret base, they sailed and sailed again, taking their toll of ship after ship. Even pirate ships were not secure from them. Indeed, the crew noted that their captain attacked these with greater spirit for on one of them he always hoped to meet Nicholas. During the twelve years that the Imogen ruled the seas, there were few governments who had not posted large rewards for her captain, but Clegg went on outwitting them. All those years he counted on the good faith of his crew. But then a mysterious discontent arose, and he demanded explanation. This ship is haunted by a devil, faltered a spokesman. He speaks to us in the night watches. He says you once blew up your own ship, sacrificing all to steal their treasure. He says you'll do it again. I'll have no devils on my ship, cried Sin. Rout him out! Here, and you'll remember me I speak now. Sin turned at the dreadful voice behind him and faced the mulatto, the survivor of the sulphur pit. Immediately the rascal began to prophesy dreadful things against the ship and crew unless they disposed of their captain. Seize him! cried Sin. Shushuga was on him in a second, drawing his knife. I cut rascal's lying tongue out. To the terrified crew there seemed to be three quick movements of the Indian's arm and a tongue and two ears fell on the deck. No talk, no hear, he said grimly. Make for the coral reef. We'll put him ashore, said Sin. It will be the more merciful. Water and sharks. They watched the marooning in silence, every man aboard. When the ship was underway again, the crew pushed forward Pete the Chinese cook, as their spokesman. He stammered that they wished to rescue the marooned man. In a blind rage, Clegg snatched a marlin spike and hit the cook. As Pete fell dead upon the deck, Clegg roared, Get aloft, you dogs! I'll have no mutiny aboard my ship! No, nor devils neither, other than myself. From the South Seas and the Coral Reef they sailed for weeks on end. Not only the crew, but Clegg himself thought of nothing but the horror of that marooning. Save on duty, he kept to his cabin. On one occasion, he whispered to Mips, Look at my forearm. I was never tattooed, and yet there is the picture of a man walking the plank. I done it, said Mips, that night in Santiago, after we sacked the town. I never see you drunk before. You ordered me to do it, with Pete's help. I can see Pete's face looking at me dead from the sea. Always, whispered Sin. It was a fault, this tattooing. Nicholas has fled because he can be so easily identified. Now I am in like case. It is bad enough to be shadowed by a living man, but to be followed by a corpse is too much to endure. Where can I hide? Dim church, under the wall, said Mips. Sure sugar and myself can hide up your tracks. Many months later, Dr. Sin met up with Mips in Boston.
So all that is left to me is Romney Marsh and quiet years. But will the past rise up against me even there? Not as far as the pirates and the Imogen is concerned, sir. Have you done it again? demanded Sin. Mips looked offended. Dead pirates tell no tales, sir. Mervyn Ransom, master of the Brig City of London, trading between Boston and London, had a great liking for his passenger, Dr. Sin. He respected this quiet scholar who had spent so many years in the service of Christianity amongst Indian tribes. The voyage was uneventful until they reached the English Channel. There they ran into the greatest storm the south coast had seen for many a year. A fire broke out in the hold as the ship was being driven onto dim church wall. "'Tis a short cut to my destination!' cried the parson. With a long cord lashed to his precious sea chest, Sin toppled it over the side just as the brig was heading for destruction. Then he and the captain jumped after the crew and the wind and the waters sang in Sin's ears.